Okay, so um, I am uh, here um, in, uh, in, not only I have a foot in England and um, another one in France, uh, but I also am an, a filmmaker and an anthropologist. There are other feet that I might have because I'm of Italian origins, so it's very simple <laughs> and very complicated. Very simple, really. Okay, so um, I was a resident at IMERA, which is the Institute for the Mediterranean of Advanced Studies of Ex-Marseille University until recently, and I had the privilege of being here for 10 uh, months. It was a unique opportunity for me to uh, develop further my um, art science framework. I'll tell you what it is in two words. It, I'm, um, uh, what I do is I use uh, uh, ethnographic filmmaking as a subject of uh, of, of research, so I use actors to represent uh, the performance that people give of themselves when they cross borders. My work is on what I call, what many people call, humanitarian borders, so, and refers to the way in which, in the context of expansion of the rights available to the citizens of the North, right? And, that coincide with a diversification of also of migration flows, there has been a restriction to the access of the labor market. Okay? In this context, which is very contradictory, asylum and humanitarian assistance has become a pressure point through which a lot of people you know, who um, uh, want to have a better life uh, in many different ways or who are fighting for their lives, right, need to certify themselves according to humanitarian terms. So this is what I call biographical borders, right? The story that you tell the state, the IOM, the agencies that certify you as a credible humanitarian subject is a biographical border. So uh, as an anthropologist, I've been working a lot on migration, gender and sexuality specifically, and I have been uh, interested in the way in which gender and sexuality specifically have become different ways for the North to talk about itself in terms of superiority, right? Whereas before 1968, it was possible to be directly racist. Now we are racist through discourses of gender and sexuality. So we are democratic because we respect gay people, unlike the Muslims, right? That's the discourse. Or we respect women also unlike the Muslims, right? Because they seem to be the other of the West, just for a change. Okay, so um, I'm now, this is very lucky because I was gonna say this in a very complicated way. <laughs> so that's gonna cut some time. So my work is on sexual humanitarianism, and, which is exactly this, the way in which particular stories and particular groups of people are produced by research, by academics as well, by art and films, and by politics as victims, yeah? And, and in the same moment, they are being given opportunities and also controlled. And this ambivalence, I think, is part of the very kind of institutional rights. You know, if you go back to Foucault, when he said that, uh, you know, the moment that king gives you rights, you also recognize that he's the king. So, you know, it's an instrument of governance, okay? So, um, I'm focusing on specific groups and specific cultural constructions of age, so unaccompanied minors for example, is a category of social protection that protects young men and young women, but also creates foyer, deports, moves, controls, certifies, right? And, uh, and, uh, and it's interesting to see on a research level how a, there is a specific form of knowledge being produced. So people like people, institutions like the IOM, you know, have been promoting particular kinds of profiling of the next victim. So there is a knowledge, there is a sociology of victimhood related to the production of these borders. I'm focusing on particular victims, minors, as I mentioned. I was working as a critical consultant for Save the Children. Uh, and and uh, all my life, as I was an anthropologist of Albanian matters uh, and, and of Romanian matters as well in relationship to minors migrating. So. I can only mention it in passing. Another strategic victim is victims of trafficking, okay? Nowadays, if, if, you, if you think of Google as the consciousness of the world, yeah, if you, tap, if you put sex work and migration into Google, 95% of pages are about trafficking. So there is no other possibility 
for people to understand and conceptualize migrants' involvement in the sex industry, either in terms of exploitation. Trafficking is very specific. It means that the person who sells sex did not want to, is forced to, doesn't get any money, and is tortured and abducted with force. So it's not like a nice story. And it's, it's, but it's, it's, the, it's the only story by you know, narrative we hear. If, if you think about films, it's a genre, there is an industry, you know, in terms of filmic and, and cinematographic industry. As well, other strategic victims, yeah, I'm using victims here in terms of real constructed victims are gay asylum seekers. It's interesting because when you are facing a, a humanitarian borders, which become a self-fulfilling narrative and self-fulfilling prophecy, um, if you are a Ukrainian sex worker in London, which is where I conducted research, and, and Ukrainian, why? Because Ukraine is not in the EU, because it's all about papers. It's all about papers. So either you say you are a victim of trafficking or you are deported, what are you going to say? If you say, well, actually, which is the reality for the majority of women we interviewed, 94% of women didn't think they were victims. If you say that and you say, well, yeah, it's not great, but it pays the rent better, I'm more free, I can get my children back in Kiev to go to a better school, nobody knows it back in the village, I'm gonna open a boutique in a few years. You're gonna be deported. You are going to be deported. So you need to enter the humanitarian borders through the biographical narrative of the victim, which is why then this becomes a statistic, then creates the fact, factoid, that the majority of migrants working in the sex industry are victims, which they are not. Okay. Same things with gay asylum seekers. What does it mean to be gay? Right? Any, what, is it, what does it mean to be gay? What does it mean to be straight? It's, it's like very enigmatic questions, okay? So, but suddenly, when you face the humanitarian borders, you've got to be coherent. So if you are somebody from Algeria who has been persecuted, but say you actually don't mind sleeping with women, which can happen, then the moment you say that in the context of a certification of a biographical border, you are going to be deported because you're not gay enough. So there is a very famous case in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Australia called the Kylie Minogue case, in which this guy, you know, obviously did his research on the stereotypes about gay people, and so he, he, he won the right not to be deported to torture and death in his own country by saying that he actually liked flamboyant clothes, um, colored cocktails, and going to concerts of Kylie Minogue, because this is what gay people do, right? Do you know what I mean? So this is why he saved his life. So this is, I'm talking about biographical borders in these terms. Okay. So why do we, why do we, um, why don't we get to hear the real story? Because it's, it's very comfort. I think, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to skip all this and I'm going to go to, um, to the film, right? How much, how much time do I have? Oh, about 10 minutes. Okay. I think that by focusing, this is my academic kind of side of the presentation, I think that by focusing on the victim of, on, of others and on the exploitation of others, which are always migrants, we emerge as privileged North-centric subjects which are not exploited, where actually, in fact, we are more and more exploitable because of neoliberal policies. So I think the Romanian victim to be different from in the context of the humanitarian kind of epistemology according to which the world suddenly is divided between us, this is the work of Ranciere, and, yeah, us who are not victims and the victims, yeah, you see, produces a depoliticized kind of vision of the world in which the reasons why people sell sex are completely overlooked. The specific inequalities, yeah, political inequalities. So, Yes, you see how rescuing then the victim becomes part of you know, a boundary making in terms of culture and hierarchies of superiority, which are always embedded in whiteness, race, and all of that. Okay, so what, uh, what I'm trying to do in my academic work is to reconceptualize the subjectivity of people who migrate according to actor network theory. Yeah, and I'm thinking about, also following what you said, Jean, um, objects, 
yeah, the concept of objectualization, the way in which objects have become more and more in postmodern times part of who we are. Okay? How, how can you, as Guattari would say, become a man yeah, if you don't produce an assemblage of a successful migrant which has a good car, a, a blonde wife, and good clothes when you come back? Having that is part of consciousness, is part of becoming somebody. So if in the process of becoming man, becoming adult, becoming successful, becoming woman, a risk has to be taken to be trafficked in the sex industry, people do it. Because that is an existential priority. So focusing on the risk, when we all take risks in different ways, when we think that who we are is about putting together specific objects, specific destinations and trajectories, right? So this is what I call mobile orientations, and this is what I'm doing uh, at the moment in my academic side of life. This is the book I'm writing called Mobile Orientations, okay? But here today, I want to talk to you about how, how can we then have a, dif a different discourse, and how can we penetrate the world of representations that makes the epistemological bullshit about the number of victims in the sex industry true? Because suddenly I'm interviewed on TV and they say, is it true that the minority of uh, sex workers are trafficked? Yeah, in, you know, it can't be otherwise. It can't be otherwise. But suddenly the lie has become the truth. So how do you move politically and, and, and academically out of it? It's to do films, I think. And I do, my films are a counter response to Lilia Forever. I don't know if you've ever seen Lilia Forever. It's the film that has defined the discourse on Natasha's yeah, in the world. Natasha is the stereotype of the Russian woman who was very pretty, she didn't know, and then the beautiful boy, you know, tricked her into it. She didn't want a total victim, she didn't know what she was doing. She's probably, you know, QI zero, okay? <laughs> which tells you also about the way in which this victimhood erases the subjectivity of women, particularly, because suddenly, you know, there's lots of Russian bimbos floating in the air. I've got no idea, no idea what's going on in their lives. No, it's, in terms of gender politics, I think it's quite insulting. So what I'm trying to do also is to make a representation of the Research Act, because obviously I am part of this anti-trafficking, if you want, industry, or the migration industry, because I get money to talk to people who probably wish, it, wish I could give them papers and leave them alone, right? It's a bit useless in terms of the immediate effect of that. So what I do is also I'm trying to use actors in my, in my films, in, in particularly in the installation, which you, you, I hope you're going to be able to see tonight as part of the Anti-Atlas, to represent the act of participating into a research. So an actor will embody in Samira a man who's called, um, whose name is Karim. Here he is. Come here, Karim, where are you? Yep. Karim was born as an effeminate, whatever that means, a young man in uh, Algeria, and therefore had to play football with his peers, which he hated, and he wanted to keep playing with his girlfriends. And then, because at a, at a certain age that was not tolerated anymore, hence a boundary, becoming man, becoming woman, then he put used hormones to have tits so that he could keep being a woman and play with his friends, but that didn't work. So. He was kicked out from his family and he decided to jump from Algeria and to go to Italy where he started selling sex because, you know, sometimes the sex industry offers people who do not fit, you know, a livelihood and a role, as marginal as it is, but, you know, he found it there. So he stays in Italy for a long time in Naples of all places, so you can imagine, it's not exactly Chelsea. And, um, if you can play the biographical boundary that you are a tr transsexual woman, you can get the paper. So, so Karim prays here specifically the transsexual woman. So this is where we put, so what I did, I, 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 I represented different articulations of the same subjectivity in different locales, okay, in different spaces. So this is the Ofra interview in which Karim tells the officer that he was always a woman inside himself. The kind of stereotypical transgender discourse that always leads to you being the right person in the wrong body or vice versa, which is really, you know, not 
exhaustive of the whole thing. Because, and, and, and then, okay, and then so we are in France, so he gets the papers, but what happens is that he cannot go back to Algeria, right? Because if you get the papers from Algeria, then saying that if you go back to Algeria, you're gonna be killed, you can't go back. His father, though, is about to die, and his brother is in prison, so Karim, looking now like this, yeah, that's Karim. Come, Karim. This is Samira, yeah? Oops. Yeah. Karim is now working as Samira at night, needs to be the head of the family. The fils aîné, but he's got tits. And he works like a hooker. So he goes back to uh, his father's deathbed. He removes before his breasts. So this is also a film about the inscription of biographical borders on the body. This is very graphic, but it is an inscription. Because a man, man hasn't got tits, right? So, you know, he removes the tits, goes to his father, and he says, what is this news about me working the, work in the streets? You know, I'm still your child. Father is dying. He needs a head of the family. So, yes, you are my son. And then he's got another problem, because he can't go back to Algeria, where his brothers and sisters waiting, are waiting for him to open the heritage. And he needs to be a man to open the heritage because that's the way he's registered in Algeria. So he marries a woman and he assembles, you see, a mobile heteronormative subjectivity by having the woman, the passport, no tits, yeah? And then with that, he brokers himself as the head of the family to Algeria. So it's a return journey from man to woman, whatever that means, and back, and from an Algerian man to a transsexual Algerian woman, which he never was. And you'll see in the film that, you know, it's, it's, it's a version that he, he, he told the Ofra, okay? But it's also true. And then he comes back. So I think that, that's, uh, so this is uh, us doing the, the film in the, in the street, yeah? And, uh, and, and this is what I tried to do with this installation. It's on two screens because I wanted to uh, um, reproduce the duality. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to reproduce the duality always. My, we should have lots of screens because it was more than two. Yeah? Um, of the official against the real, which is a bit of a labyrinth, really, because in many cases, she always told the truth to everybody. And that's what she says. She, when I asked her, because at some stage she says, oh yeah, you know, when I was young, I wanted to be free, I was suffocating in Algeria, you know, I was beautiful, I wanted to have fun. And I went, but you told me that you wanted to go to France or to Italy because your family was gonna kill you. I went, yeah, yeah, of course that, but you know, I told that to the Ofpra. Because otherwise they wouldn't give me the papers. If I told her I was happy and gorgeous, what, they were gonna say, oh good, bon débarras, amuse-toi, vas-y, no? And so he said, like, and he said a, a sentence that I really, I think, if you want, sums it up a bit. And, and it says, like, suffering doesn't give you papers. Uh, suffering gives you paper. C'est pas, c'est, c'est pas le bonheur qui te donne les papiers. C'est la souffrance. Right? Le bonheur, c'est pour les amis. And so that's the kind of thing. And, but, and, and I, I, it, my enigma, like the enigma that I found myself confronted with, was that I also thought that it was telling the truth to the Ofpra. Because there was a part of him which was not a man. And that he felt more confident to tell the Ofpra than to his other Algerian friends around him. So you see how the confessional space that humanitarian borders offer sometimes also protect you know, specific rights because in a way he is also a transsexual woman. Transsexual meaning travesty because they, the Algerian migrants selling sex call themselves transsexuals but they are not. Yeah, they, are don't, they, are not, they don't have the operation because otherwise, as you know in the sex industry, you don't work. Right? That's a detail, but it's not a big, it's not a small detail. Okay, so that's it. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy it. Um, and I hope I made justice of, um, of um, you know, the academic and the artistic side of it. I think by using actors, I also wanted, obviously, to protect the identity of somebody who 
we might be, we might think we can deal with, but is very, very vulnerable in terms of being undocumented, stigmatized, marginalized in sexual, gender, and many other terms, okay? But at the same time, I, I refuse, I refuse, I, I finish. I refuse the voyeurism that is embedded in research. I, I want to use actors, and I want the people to be irritated by me using actors because I want them to be sitting with their own voyeurism. Why would you want to see the real thing? Who is the real thing? Anyway, you know, in, when, where is, what is this fetishism about uh, uh, authenticity that we are confronted with, you know, when we talk about borders and who has the power to certify that authenticity. I think this is what I'm trying to, to do with the art. And I think it's important. I think it's important. Otherwise, we get all of these flying Natasha's and all of these very powerful fictions according to which lots of people get deported and lots of other people feel very good about themselves, but they shouldn't be. OK, that's it. And I can tell you more about uh, everything during the exhibition.